little wonder. She is one of the country's best known historians of the 19th century and beyond, with a nearly unmatched ability to connect the events of the Civil War and its legacies with the unfolding, and she might say, unraveling story of politics and culture in America today. She's the author of a number of books, including West from Appomattox, The Reconstruction of America After the Civil War, and To Make Men Free, A History of the Republican Party. Many know Heather not only for these books, but for her letters from an American, her daily digest and analysis of current events in which she not only offers sources, but her sense of a larger context in which to put these events. To so many of us, and I wholeheartedly include myself, these letters available as emails or on Facebook feel like lifelines. Though often <clears throat> alarming and dispiriting, they also widen the perspective, offering room not only for thought, but for action. Heather will talk for a few minutes about the book or on anything she would like to talk about, but would also welcome questions and interaction, which Aaron Cox will field. So please feel, feel free to join in digitally. Thanks for joining us, Heather, and welcome. Well, it's a pleasure to be here, and welcome to all you Oxford people. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the book, but I also want to talk about why I published it with Oxford and some of the directions that I think that maybe book publishing are going from my perspective as an author. I hope that might be of some use. Um, and, and frankly, it's something nobody's asked me, and I think this book was really in many ways an experiment that turned out to work. Uh, so it might be worth thinking about why it worked and how um, how Tim and I wrote it in the way we did um, to, to make things work. So uh, the book itself was kind of a, um, uh, it, it was funny. There were, there were six books uh, that I pitched, uh, first to friends and then to my agent. And um, and I, I, you know, I'd say, well, I really want to write this book. And they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then I would say, and I want, really want to write this book. And my favorite response was, that sounds like a great book for you and like one other person. And, and their re reaction was all the same. And at the end, I would always say, but, you know, there's this article I want to write about, you know, how really the, the democracy kind of seemed like it triumphed in the East uh, after the Civil War, but then everybody moved West. And, you know, the real story of America and the rise of oligarchies in the West. And I think it'd be a cute little article. And everybody would snap to attention and go, that's a prize winning book. And, um, and I didn't really believe them. And the, the, I have to give credit here to my agent, uh, Lisa Adams from the Garamond Agency, for continuing to say, please keep at it. It took me about four years to put together the proposal and to figure out what exactly this book was going to look like. But what I really wanted to talk about in it was a couple of things. First of all, why we were in a moment that looked so much like the Confederacy, which is, of course, where we get the title, uh, which I did not write. Um, it is, uh, I don't think she will mind me saying this, it was Mary Builder from BC Law School who said, oh, there's your title. And um, uh, um, the, the, what I really wanted to do is talk about why we were in this moment, which is how we got the title. And, and also it's advancing a new theory of politics and it's a theory of politics based in language. And I think that's really reflective of where we are today, that since the rise of uh, Rush Limbaugh, for example, we understand that the way people talk about politics matters a lot. So I wanted to unpack that and really look for a theoretical reason for how politics in a democracy could often turn into a, into a defensive oligarchy. And that's really the large story behind the book. But what it argues, of course, is that baked into American history is a paradox. The idea that equality for some people depends on inequality for others. And that's an idea that is not original to me, although I expanded it a lot. It comes from American Slavery, Slavery American Freedom by Edmund Morgan, published in this in 1970 or 71, as I recall off the top of my head. And what I argued was that because uh, for the founders, the idea that some people could be equal depended on removing from the body politic women and people of color, not simply African Americans, but also indigenous Americans in the colonial age era and then later on of course uh, by the mid 19th century uh, Chinese or Chinese Americans and Mexicans or Mexican Americans and certainly the Pacific Islanders who by then were starting to come into the West Coast because equality for some depended on inequality for those people oligarchs have been able to mobilize a corollary to that 
which is to say whenever it appears that women or people of color are going to approach equality, by definition, that means inequality for white men. And when they mobilize that in four stages, they are able to undercut democracy, first by creating a society that believe, increasingly encourages the idea that white men belong on top, that they're favored by God, they're smarter, they're better educated, they know how to run things better. Um, then gradually, as the policies that those men put in place increasingly hurt in everybody, including members, white uh, members of society, white men, um, increasingly they go ahead and they manipulate the system by either getting rid of voters or by um, by um, you know messing around with gerrymandering in this era, it was different in the 1850s, and then gradually taking over the country and insisting that they are truly the nation's leaders and the only ones who should rule. And you know it's so clear in the 1850s. And so you know I felt like I've been seeing it in America really since um, William F. Buckley Jr. wrote God versus Man at Yale. Um, and, or I'm sorry, God and Man at Yale, my God versus Man, God and Man at Yale in 1951, but really taking off since Reagan and since Reagan's deliberate use of language in a way to create a fiction, something that journalists recognized at the time, but simply didn't didn't gain traction with the people who um, who embraced his idea. And of course, I had no idea when I started writing this book back um, six years ago. Right, right. It was in the last year or so. It would have been. Um, 2013, because it was before my last book came out, I had no idea that we were going to end up with Donald Trump. I, but it seemed like all the signs pointed that direction unless the Republican Party stopped. So that's what the book did. Um, and of course, the book ends on a note of hope, the idea that as, as uh, people of color had mobilized in 2016, but as women, especially white women, mobilized after, uh, after 2020, I'm sorry, after 2016, that the 2020 election had the hope of restoring democracy to America. Now, of course, um, we're a knife edge. And that is, I think, the point from which the letters have taken off, sort of a, a chronicle of which direction is this going. But I told you I would talk a little bit about the book itself, the actual physical production of the book, and why it's at OUP, and why it was with Tim Bend. Um, and the reason for that is that it was pretty clear, you know, it took me about literally about four years to work out the theory behind it, which is actually a pretty complicated historical theory. It's not referenced in the book at all. But I have, um, you know, literally an entire piece written that someday I will publish about sort of taking on Hayden White and taking on the nature of communicating um, through uh, through certain kinds of emotions in um, in narrative, and um, that that. It's, it is, as I say, not in the book, but it's a really deeply theoretically based book, although in, a, in what I hope is an original theory. But it's also got a ton of material because it covers all of American history, but it does so in a very pointed way. And I talked to a number of editors about the book. And interestingly enough, I, I wanted, always wanted to keep it very, very short with the idea that nobody reads long stuff any longer. They really don't. I don't know about you guys, but I have the attention span of a gnat at this point. And most of the editors I talked to said, um, well, a book that has, that has this many ideas and it needs to be much, much bigger than you're proposing. We need to increase it by at least half. And I felt like they weren't getting the point that if you had really big ideas, they needed to be in a really small space, not in a really big space. And Tim got that. He was like, yeah, we want people to actually read this book, not just to say they have read it. And a part of the idea behind that was to put what, to my mind, was pretty serious theoretical material into a really readable package, which is not an easy thing to do. So I wanted the book to read as if, as I told people, I had just rolled out of bed and thrown some stuff on a piece of paper, rather in imitation of David Donald's Lincoln. If you know that book, um, one of David, uh, David Donald's real masterpiece in many ways, although it did not win the Pulitzer the way his uh, two of his other books did, I think because he made it look so easy. You know, you read those paragraphs on Lincoln and Lincoln's, you know, sort of deciding if he's gonna become a Republican or if he's not. And it seems like David Donald just sort of, you know, woke up and thought, oh, I know some shit. But, but knowing him and knowing how much work went into it, both in the crafting of the writing and in the research, I knew that that was one of the most profound books ever written. And I wanted mine to read the same way, as if I sort of was like, oh, yeah, I, I can't remember this. And to make it look like it was really lighthearted. And the first draft, Tim, I remember distinctly wrote we on it and did did dial me back a little bit on that, I think intelligently, um, because I just, I kind of almost wanted to feel like, almost like beach reading, 
But in that idea of keeping big ideas short, there was also something that Ron Suskind brought on board. And I had been doing a, a, a thing with Ron Suskind, and um, who is just a, a, a truly lovely man, a truly lovely man. Um, and um, uh, and uh, he, the last thing he said to me, I was that we had we had stopped doing what we were doing, and for a number of reasons. And I was giving him a ride back to his house, and um, and we always chatted at great length in these talks in the in the car rides, and. Um, and I, I was working on the book at the time and I'd written the first chapter and I was not happy with it. It was kind of a, you know, it was long. It was, there was too much in it. It was everything I knew sort of thing. And he goes, Heather, here's how you write a best-selling book. He said, you take, um, you make sure that every chapter is no longer than 7,500 words. And then you divide those into four equal length chapters, all of which stand alone as essays, because that puts them in a, I think it's about, I suck at math, but I think it's about seven and a half pages and somebody can read it before bed. And those stand alone essays put together as a chapter, you know, sort of are the building blocks to a larger argument. He goes, try it and you'll see. And I, this is so contrary to anything that historians do. I really had a hard time with it at first, but then the momentum picked up. And there was a time I wrote the, I remember writing the, um, at a stand-up desk, writing the chapter on um, 1939 movies um, in, you know, in basically in an afternoon while I was alternating at the stand-up desk, um, cross-stitching a, a treason weasel, um, little one of the little weasels with the Donald Trump heads on it for a friend's birthday that day. And I managed over the course of that day, and if you feel the pace in that section, you will know that, that it went really quickly. And, it, and I, think it, I think it worked. I think that pace really worked. So, um, so we put together this short book in this new kind of, to me anyway, style that I was not at all convinced was a book. I wrote to my friend Mike Green at least three times going, Michael, is it a book? It doesn't feel like a book. It's not a history book. It's written by in a series of essays. It's, you know, does this work? And he kept, he literally would just write back, yes, Heather, it's a book. Yes, Heather, it's a book. And obviously it is. When we brought it out, I was like, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know if it's going to fly. I don't know any of this stuff. But it did work. And it strikes me that maybe this is something that publishers ought to be thinking about, the idea not only of shorter books, but also shorter books with a different kind of structure to them. Because clearly this is a style at this moment that works. Now, I don't think it's going to last. I do think people are going to go back to longer stuff when, when perhaps our politics slows down a bit and the, the pace of things coming at us slows down a bit. But for now, I actually think that it was a really good model and maybe worth thinking about it. So I'm going to stop there um, because I suspect you have questions about other stuff, but I thought that was interesting. Um, somebody here is now asking, what is, have I been the most surprised about with the release of the book, the response and so on? Um, uh, I will be honest, I, that book came out on April 1st. Think about it. it. The joke was on us, right? Could it have been worse timed? I mean, that's just when the lockdown started. Nobody knew what was going on. I think what has surprised me most is how well it is sold. And which I, I mean, from the number of, of letters I get about it and um, and by how many people who were not otherwise interested in history have suddenly decided that they think it's a great book. It has not really gotten negative reviews among um, ordinary readers. Uh, I think somebody somebody was not happy. Maybe Tim can help on this. Was it the Wall Street Journal didn't like it, but who expected the Wall Street Journal to like it, right? Um, so I think my biggest surprise has been um, how well it is sold and um, and how many people who otherwise would never have read something like this um, did. <laughs> if I could predict the future, I would be an extremely wealthy woman. The question is, uh, if I could predict the future, what does the country look like for a second term with Trump? Um, so I want to start by saying I'm a historian, as I always do my disclaimer, I'm a historian, I'm a uh, a prophet of the past, not of the future. So I don't know what the future is going to look like. Now, that being said, as a historian who we study patterns in society to see, to make predictions about the future so that we make, can make good decisions about the future, I do not think it is at all clear that Trump is not going to be reelected. His numbers suck, as you know, but um, his campaign is trying very hard simply to game the system out in swing states. And I don't know if you're watching this, I haven't been able to write about it in the letters because it's, it's, they're fairly little stories. I've actually got a file of them in the hopes that I can um, can put them all together for a paragraph at some point. They're fighting tooth and nail in swing states to throw out ballots. 
And I personally am extremely concerned about um, about the, the voting machines, uh, not least because if you look at the way that Trump has been talking about mail-in voting, we're all focusing on the fact he doesn't like mail-in voting. We're not focusing so much on the fact that he is deliberately driving people to voting machines. And we know that voting machines are hackable. We know in North Carolina, for example, in 2016, the voting machines suddenly went haywire. Why has never been, expect, uh, been explained, but it did mean that many, many people in North Carolina could not vote in 2016. And, um, and the, the new, there were new machines deployed across the country after 2016. They were supposed to be impregnable. And at the first trial of them, um, everybody who studies this stuff threw their hands up and went, these are, these are worse than before. So I'm really, really concerned about the sanctity of the vote. If, if it were a fair vote, he would not win, but I'm not at all convinced it would be fair. Now, okay, that being said, um, a, a second term with Trump, there will be no guardrails. And one of the things that I keep talking about to the, the Trump voters who are, you know, think rah, rah, we want Trump, is that he needs them this time around, he will not need them next time around. So if, if Trump is reelected, I do expect an all out, um, basically a fascist coup. I expect we will go full out fascism. Um, and that used to terrify me even more than it does now. And the reason that I am a little bit um, hesitant about, I mean, about, it, things will be bad. I mean, things are bad now. P people don't look and think about the fact that we have, for example, you know, People incarcerated, you know, we, we literally have concentration camps in our country right now, places where people are concentrated because they are people that the state considers enemies. And these, of course, are, are refugees from uh, South America. And that's a story that is not getting nearly enough attention. Um, the the kleptocracy going on is really really bad i mean there's a, the, the stuff is it, right now is much worse than our day-to-day -day lives are making it that being said and now that you're all quaking in your boots i don't think a, a, a trump uh takeover can last for the simple reason that the people that are currently in power are really old something we don't talk about a lot but they're you know, mitch mcconnell i think he's 78 years old um donald trump is 74 um, they're not going to live forever, although Dick Cheney maybe puts the lie to that, but you know, they're really not going to live forever. And one of the things about the Trump dynasty and the Trump administration is that by definition, they have kind of killed off, not literally, but um, but in uh, by firing the real brains um, in the operation. And it's very hard for me to see as much as people like Tom Cotton and Jim Jordan and um, John Radcliffe, uh, Radcliffe, as much as they they want to be dictators or want to be in power to to do to bring things to their own end, it, it is my impression um, from watching them they're not that smart. I mean, Mitch McConnell's really smart. Uh, similarly, like like Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly, like him or hate him, is really smart guy. Sean Hannity, not so much. So I look at that the fact that that old generation is going to die and the people going in their place are just just don't have the mental chops. Jared Kushner, and um, and I look at the fact that younger people are adamantly against this regime, and the young people have a lot of really smart people in them. And I think you know, yes, he could win again, and he could do really horrible things. But I don't think uh, you know. I was, I was discussing this, and I won't use your name, but I was discussing this with somebody yesterday. Um, and uh, and she, I said this to her, and she's like, oh, my God. And I said, you know, I really don't see the rise of a regime like the USSR that's going to dominate this country for 40 or 50 years. I see a new... If he's a, if he's not... I mean, we're going to have we're going to have trouble either way because because he's deliberately um, um, inflaming his base against the idea of a Biden victory. So we're going to have four or five months of trouble anyway. But even if Trump emerges victorious, which is, of course, one of the reasons that he's trying to pack the court as quickly as he is, is in case the, the, this gets thrown in the Supreme Court, he wants to be sure he's got six votes or five votes. Roberts might not do that. Um, but even if that happens, I really don't see it, it lasting, you know, much longer than at most the four years it'll take to get us to 2024. So, excuse me, I'd like to sound more hopeful and say, oh, he's never going to win. And if he is, we'll, we'll rein him in. No, the, the guardrails are gone now, so are almost gone now. So I don't foresee if he gets reelected, I think he, it's going to be a free-for-all um, for his people. But, um, but I'm really prepared for it in a way I wasn't prepared for 2016. And, and my gut sense is it's not going to happen, that in fact, at the end of the day, he's not going to be reelected. If he is reelected, I think we got ourselves a real problem, but maybe not a long, not, maybe not a lifetime problem. 
Um, how did the country get so divided? Is there hope for the country to be reunited or are we in the precipice of another civil war? The country got divided by language. I mean, this is the whole point of, of how the South won the civil war. Uh, the, the, the deliberate use by the movement conservatives. So what happens is that you, know, you got the Republicans and you got the Democrats coming out of World War II and both of them agree on what they call the liberal consensus, the idea that the government has a role to play regulating business and, and protecting a uh, basic social safety net and promoting infrastructure. And, you know, people forget until the coronavirus, last coronavirus bill, it was um, Dwight Eisenhower, who a Republican, who pushed the largest um, uh, public works uh, program in history. That's the Interstate Highway Act, and uh, until the coronavirus uh, stimulus, and um, and it's also Republicans who uh, who passed Brown versus Board of Education. That is a unanimous decision coming out of a Republican Supreme Court. And it's also Republicans, a Republican court uh, who um, decide Roe versus Wade in 1973, and that decision is written by a Republican. I mean, this is this isn't something that people agree on. But what happened was that in 1960, um, there's a, a, a uh, not a philosopher, a, he becomes a political scientist, um, a guy named Phil Converse, who writes this piece in which he called the American Voter, in which he says, you know, it's really not worth appealing to people based on ideology because Democrats and Republicans agree with each other. So what you really need to do to win elections is you need to go ahead and try and nail together coalitions of like, you know, Mark Twain readers over here and Duluth typists over here. And, you know, you nail together these coalitions and stop talking about lofty ideals. And you can really see this if you're interested in if you, you can go to YouTube and you can watch the um, uh, Nixon Kennedy debates and you will be shocked at the level of the discussion because they are literally talking about the meaning of government, the direction of government, what it means to chair certain committees in Congress. You know, they're really talking about the kind of stuff I talk about in the letters and that goes all out the window because um, of Converse's idea that you stop that because we all agree on that. Now we just got to worry about promising, you know, my my typists in Duluth that they're going to get cheaper typewriter ribbons. And when that happens, uh, the movement conservatives, who are those who disagree with the concept of the liberal consensus altogether, put in place that policy that um, or that program that William F. Buckley Jr. outlined in God and Man at Yale in 1951, in which he said, you know, we basically have to reject the Enlightenment. And by the way, the, the subtitle of that book is The Superstition of Academic Freedom. And what he was trying to say was the idea of academic freedom, the idea of the Enlightenment that you should, in fact, move society forward by um, presenting factual arguments and people will, you know, the majority of people will choose the right one. Um, or, and move society forward. He says, you know, we got to reject that. We have to start from the principle that the liberal consensus is wrong. It's just dead wrong. It's like communism. We have to start from the principle of what he called free enterprise, by which he meant no regulation of business, and Christianity, um, which was he was a devout Catholic. And from that, you know, we can maybe talk a little bit about stuff. But that's our story. And instead of trying to impress upon re, upon um, our voters that they want that, because every time we try and tell them that, they vote for another damn liberal, and that would include a. Um, Republicans as well as Democrats, because he's really going to go rabid after the election of uh, Dwight Eisenhower, who's a Republican. That's when he starts after Brown for Support of Education is when he starts the National uh, National Review. Um, instead of actually appealing to people's reason, we simply have to tell them a story. We have to appeal to their emotion, and we have to to rise, you know, to to make them angry and to get them on our team. And in 1950, in 1954, when um, Joe McCarthy, Senator Joe McCarthy from Wisconsin goes after what he calls communists in Congress. He really gives them a blueprint for attacking. And, you know, McCarthy says he's an outsider protecting the country against communism. It's crap. He's a, he's a senator himself. And he, he doesn't have a list of communists in Congress. I mean, he made that up. Um, but he manages to get attention. And he lies and he blusters. And he portrays this image of this individual against the behemoth state. And that really takes off with the John Birch Society, which is formed around the idea of John Birch, a young man in China who discovers that the State Department is deliberately spreading communism and he gets assassinated for his uh, for his um, his uh, exposure exposing that plot and that idea of the individual against society is of course such a mythic one I mean it's really tied into the Bible and it's tied into Gilgamesh and it's tied into you know every possible little guy story and that I think that language is what captures so many voters especially when because of American history it's tied into racism 
You know, the whole idea of that lone cowboy standing against, you know, savages and the government is one that's born right of Reconstruction when the idea arises among those who are opposed to the Republicans' control of Reconstruction and their use of the government to promote equality for African Americans. The idea that that is, is socialism or communism, which they begin calling it in uh, that in 1871, long before there's any Bolshevik revolution or anything else, um, you tie that idea of the little guy against the state and then you say the state is helping people of color and later feminist women after 1970. And that's an idea that really resonates with a number of people who are increasingly left out of American society, first in the 1960s by the social movements and the anti-war movement. If you remember in 19, you probably don't, but in 1970, Time Magazine's Person of the Year was the middle Americans who, um, who stood against the people in the streets. Um, Time being a, a conservative magazine. And then, um, and then that really takes off uh, under Ronald Reagan and the the failure of the the um, or the, the the abandonment of the fairness doctrine in 18, 1987, with the idea that you no longer have to present both sides of the story and you no longer have to have your ideology based in fact. And you know the story that they tell on places like Fox News is a very compelling story. It's a story that of course we reprised in Star Wars in 1977, right before Ronald Reagan is elected, and it's a story that is actually, if you do the studies of Fox News, designed to release endorphins the same way that professional wrestling is. So people really do literally get hooked on that political story. So I think we got divided by that, uh, by the language that was empl empl employed. Um, can we heal from that? Absolutely. We need, uh, we need leaders that that refuse to divide people and instead play to the middle. And you can see, if you're watching this, I should write about this now that I think about it, if you watch um, Joe Biden, and people the um, people who who tend to think left on um, Twitter, I was like, stop talking about about working across the aisle. Um, I, you know, I, I think you have to be a little careful with the, what Biden is doing. Does he really mean to um, to sort of give up the ghost and and do what Republicans say? I think what he's really doing is using language to reassure people that he can return to a world without division. And if that were the case. Um, the, if you look at every single statistic about gun control, about abortion, about welfare, about I, all the hot button issues, um, more than like on all of the ones I just mentioned, more than 70% of Americans agree. Um, you know, everybody wants some form of gun control. Every, not everybody, at least 70%. At least 70% of Americans believe that abortion should be safe and legal under some circumstances. You know, there's there, there's all these things on which we agree, but you know, the whole point of movement conservatism was to go ahead and, and movement conservatism, of course, took over the Republican Party, was to go ahead and divide people and to convince them to vote for people like George W. Bush by convincing them that the that the libtards, as um, Rush Limbaugh used to say, I hated them. And that, that you know, I was thinking of Andrew Dice Clay, the comedian. He was incredibly hot and incredibly popular until suddenly he wasn't. You know, suddenly the country turned on the bully. And I think that now you're seeing people turn on the Republican Party because they are so blatantly bullying the rest of us. That being said, they hold an awful lot of cards right now. Okay, do I have any reflections about the mobilization after the uh, the murder of George Floyd, especially about the historical role of policing in the US racial order? Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts about that. And because this is a somewhat closed group, I will actually tell them to you. Um, first of all, can I just say long overdue? Uh, one of the things I like to point out when we talk about Black Lives Matter right now is that the violence against African Americans did not begin in the recent past. And the story that I tell about that is um, one that um, if anybody's eating their lunch, you should put it down. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, who was running around in the early 1980s. Most people don't know that they know Jeffrey Dahmer because he was a serial killer. And I'm so sorry for those of you who are eating your lunch. He, um, he was horrible. Do not Google him. Do not read what he did, because I did, um, because I was, Actually, because when I was doing my last book, the police officer who was in charge of him had the same last name as one of the guys in my book. I want to say it was Norquist, to be honest, but I could be wrong about that. And so these stories kept coming up and I thought, well, what the hell's going on here? Why should, why should I read about this? And then I did and I regret it. Anyway, um, uh, Dahmer, um, 
Dahmer not only uh, killed his victims, he killed them in terribly gruesome ways that I will not elaborate upon, but he also consumed them. And um, one of the things that doesn't show up in, in our popular culture about Jeffrey Dahmer is that serial killers almost always specialize in a certain demographic. That is, that's how, generally how they find them. They are obsessed with a certain demographic. Dahmer is different in that, and that, and that demographic almost always is their own racial background. I mean, according to what I've read, I'm not, a, I'm not a forensic expert, but that's what I read when I was doing all this. Dahmer was different because Dahmer killed across, he killed young men and he killed across races. But interestingly enough, he did not, uh, he did not do the, it's hard to say this without saying the, the, the stuff involved. Um, the, the really horrific stuff he did, he did not do to his white victims. He tended to kill his white victims and dump them. For the people of color he killed, uh, Asian young men, boys, and African American, either boys or young men, he did worse things. Now I mention all this because this was in the early 1980s. And Dom, this is important because Dahmer lived on the a line in Milwaukee between the black community and the white community. The black community called the cops on Dahmer again and again and again and again. And they kept saying something is really not right here. His apartment smells, things are bad. And on at least one occasion, the police came and checked out Dahmer and actually one of his victims had escaped and they returned the victim to Dahmer, laughing about the fact as Dahmer told them it was a lover's spat. Um, and when finally the, um, the uh, one of the victims um, escaped and the the and, and took the police back to Dahmer's apartment and the police opened the door and there were photographs of the victims and everything around the I mean it was bad when that came out the black community took to the took to the newspapers and took to the streets and said we told you we told you that this was going on and you know first of all under reagan you have cut all of our pro job programs all of our education programs all of uh, you know all of the things that were making us equals in american society and giving us you know leveling the playing field now you there's a white guy who is literally eating us and you are still doing nothing so milwaukee put together uh um uh, uh, a commission to go ahead and look at whether or not there really was racial bias in policing in Milwaukee. This is in er the early 1980s. And, um, and the conclusion was, yeah, things are really bad here. Does anyone remember that, that study? I mean, it, 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 it came out, it fell into the water and it disappeared. So my point is that the George Floyd stuff, yes, but oh, come on. I mean, this should have, and th that was the eighties, but, it's been going on all along. So why now? The question is why now? And I always equate what's going on with the George Floyd protest and the Black Lives Matter protests to abolitionism. When, you know, again, the idea of, um, of the evils of human enslavement is not new when the abolitionist movement takes off in the 1830s. And the abolitionist movement doesn't really go anywhere hugely in the 1830s doesn't go hugely anywhere in the 1840s. It never really goes hugely anywhere. It never gets more than about 1% of the Northern population. But that being said, it really begins to affect American, American politics in the late 1840s and the 1850s. Why? Because at that point, the abolitionists are able to connect what the elite slaveholders are doing to their enslaved human beings to what is happening to white Americans and their civil liberties. I think abolitionism really takes off when abolitionists are able to convince white Americans that the attacks on black people in the 1850s, 1840s, 1850s, are just the forerunner to what's going to happen to white people. And I don't necessarily mean literally. White people might not literally have believed in the 1850s that they were going to be enslaved, but they certainly believed that they were going to lose their civil liberties and their economic opportunities at the hands of those large slaveholders. And that's really clear from the writing. And I look at that and I think, you know, why suddenly does the do the Floyd protests take off? Well, they take off in part because there are cameras now, but there have been cameras. I mean, we've seen this stuff at least since the 1980s and the 1990s. Once you had cell phones, these videos were there. And the stories are, they are truly horrific. Um, you know, there's, there's a, um, 
a group that's chronicling these one at a time. Um, and the, the stories are, are they're, they've been there. And, and again, uh, you just feel so, so horrible for these families whose, whose, whose family members were shot in the back and, and, and ignored really. Anyway. Um, uh, so why now? Why now? Because I think the excesses of the Trump administration have made Americans in general recognize that their own liberties, their own rights are on the table. And the George Floyd especially, but also Breonna Taylor, um, those two especially, I think, um, have given us a, a, an individual. They have personified that overreach and of the, the federal government and its attack on civil liberties. And, um, and so I think that jumps out. I will say that, that um, for, for at least I think maybe for women of my age, Breonna Taylor was really a kick in the gut because she's our children's age. And and you know you look at you look at that beautiful young face and you think oh I remember somebody just like her sitting at, at my kitchen table and and she was murdered and uh, in her bed and, and there's an argument about whether or not she was in her bed but I, I you know she wasn't doing anything um, so I think that gave us a person to 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 solidify this fear of civil liberties by the way I'm telling you what I think about this stuff. I'm not the voice of God here. I'm just bringing history to this 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 stuff, and I could be dead wrong. But but you asked me what I think about it, so I'm going for it. All right. Uh, yeah, I do think. So the question is, uh, do I think that all of the Black Lives Matter movement and calls for progress will help bring real change in equality, or will things go back to the way they've always been since the news dies down? I think that there. I think that we're at a moment of extraordinary change. It, this moment parallels that of the other three major changes of uh, historical changes in American history. So if you think about the times we have brought about real change uh, for progress in American society, they were the Civil War, of course. They were, which is, I'm sorry, they sparked by um, uh, by westward expansion. That's a huge crisis for the country. I mean, again, our, our textbooks kind of say, oh, it's great, you know, whatever, except for the, the, the people who are overrunning. But the reality is it's a societal crisis, as demographics are messed up, as voting is messed, you know, it's a crisis. Uh, the next crisis, of course, is industrialization in the late 19th century, which gives us the progressive era. The next crisis is, um, globalization, if you will, the, the rise of a global world after World War II. And now, of course, we have an internal enemy, an internal fear of the rise of dictatorship and the destruction of democracy. In each one of those eras, we have come back much stronger and much better. And um, the, But the kicker to all of those is that there is one um, similarity to all of them that we don't emphasize enough. And in the on the heels of all of those things, what we have had was uh, um, a compression of the economy, so that there is not there are not extremes of wealth. That we that extremes of wealth and extremes of poverty come much much closer together. And whenever people feel like they are um, they can feed their families and they have enough money, they are much more likely to suggest that um, that the the playing field should be level. They're much less likely to turn against each other. So that's why I'm always harping on economic rights over any other kind of rights because you know everyone's talking about black rights or women's rights, all of which are important, but I'm the one sort of, not the one, one of the ones saying we gotta fix the economy first. That being said, there's also something else really big at, at stake and that is that uh, rising up from age 30 and under, are people now who see the world in a much more global way than people my age because they were reared under the internet. And they have a really different idea about race and about class and about upward mobility and about America's position in the world. And they see the world in a much more um, multivalenced way than the people my age and older who remember the USSR and who grew up through the Cold War, who really, I think, tend to see things in an extraordinarily black and white way. It's us versus them. We're the winners or we're the losers. For people um, like under 30, the world is much more nuanced. There's a lot more gray. They, they understand what it's like to live in constrained spaces without being a loser. And this is one of the things that I thought um, was really apparent with, I know he's older, but I think he, um, he really picked up on this, um, Barack Obama's foreign policy, because he, he really recognized um, 
multifaceted foreign policy as opposed to simply us being the elephant in the room. And that I think drove the older guys who were used to Americans simply throwing their weight around absolutely insane because they, they, they thought he was giving something up. In fact, I think he was really just recognizing what the world was gonna look like if there was not neither a Cold War nor a war on terror. And, and the fact that we seem to have walked away from that and tried to return to America throwing its weight around, I think is a real loss because I think we were a leader in a new kind of foreign policy and we have just jettisoned it. And that is that that is unfortunate. So I do think there will be real change. There has to be real change. Look at the climate. I mean, it's either real change or death. And, you know, humans at the end of the day are not stupid. Democracy is slow, but that, that ship does turn around. What can each of us do to help improve the challenges the country is facing, perhaps in terms of economic equality? So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to, what my take on that is, but then I'm also going to tell you about somebody else. Um, my take on this, again, because I have come to believe that what changes politics is language, is my thing is always take up oxygen. Always take up oxygen, you know, when somebody, you don't have to be uh, horrible about it, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's do it in such a way that other people want to join you, I think is uh, a, an important one. But, you know, for a long time, people who did not agree with the direction in which the country was going kind of smiled politely or looked the other way when their neighbor talked in ways that were really unacceptable. And um, I think we take that space back and say, you know, you're not welcome in my house if you're going to talk that way. Or, um, or on social media, um, when somebody posts something, you know, batshit insane or whatever, um, uh, <clears throat> saying not like you're an idiot, but, oh, did you see that this story was debunked here? Um, and, oh, I feel stupid, you know, or I feel, I, I hate it when I get fooled by these or something like that. Because what will change pol politicians is their constituents. So my thing on it is always call people, write people, take up oxygen, push back, think of it like a cocktail party. You know, you want to isolate that guy who's spouting crap in the corner until you can either bring him around or throw him out of the room. That being said, there are an awful lot of mechanical things one can do as well in addition to voting. And there's all kinds of organizations, of, which I'm about to post on my Facebook um, uh, page, by my professional Facebook page, by the way, uh, gathered by... Um, by uh, one of my readers, you know, there are, there are campaigns to text voters in in other states to help make sure people get to um, to the polls, to make plans for voting, to put pressure on senators right now not to hold a confirmation hearing for whomever um, Donald Trump nominates for Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat, to um, to obviously to donate money, but but actually to to actually mobilize the country. And um, you can look for that. That's actually not my thing. I'm not really an organizer. I'm much more of, of an observer. But this woman, whose name is Susan Rogan, she has a, a list called Rogan's List. Um, uh, she's very good. Um, she has a lot of ideas that what people can actually do. And then in terms of economic equality, pressure. Pressure on your Congress people. You know, as a friend of mine said, if I if I hear any more about, uh, I'm sorry, by the way, as somebody who voted for Trump and is a Republican, so you know, if I hear any more about tax cuts, you know, I don't need a, I don't need an expletive tax cut. I need you know for my kids to be able to work a job without and, and to get decent pay and and for the all the monies to stop going to the top. So just make your voice heard. Uh, what should we read, listen to, and watch in order to be well informed of the issues from all sides? Personally, I read individuals less than papers. Although that being said, I think the LA Times and the Washington Post have been absolutely knocking it out of the park lately. I also really like, um, um, there's a new, crap, I can never remember the name of it. It's not the bulwark, it's the new one. There is a new um, uh, conservative, not Republican. Some of them are, are never, uh, never Trumpers. Um, uh, conservative magazine. What the heck is? Can somebody help me out? What the heck is it called? It's, it's, it's. Uh, Bill Crystal writes for it. Got a lot of young new voices, and they're really good. Um, crap, I can't think of the name of it. I'm sorry. Um, it's not. It's the something, but it's not the bulwark. The bulwark has good stuff too, but it's not the bulwark. That being said, um, we're in a funny moment because. Um, because the, the Trump people really are way outside the norm. 
way outside the norm. So when people say, oh, you're, you're, you're not being fair to Trump, it's like, well, well, you know, I can't be, you know, I would love to be fair to true conservative ideas like the ones that are presented in the bulwark or in, oh, come on, crap. It's a, it's a red and black, just drawn a blank on it. Or they, I mean, th those ideas are worth reading and they're worth engaging with. Um, but they are, um, uh, those are, you know, re Republicans, Trumpers call them, um, call them left wing and, and they're simply not, you know, right now we are so far to the right and every statistic will say, say that to you. It's very hard to read things that defend Trump that are not way, way off the charts. So if you're interested in, again, in stuff from the right as well as from the left, um, uh, well, Jennifer Rubin has been, again, knocking it out of the park, although she took the word conservative off of her ID the other day because she said, I can't, I just can't even have this word here anymore because the people who call themselves conservative are off the charts crazy. Um, but the Wall Street Journals has some stuff, some good stuff. And I read, I always read Tom Nichols. I always read Just Security. I always, which that's a blog. Tom Nichols is a is a security guy. I always read Tom Nichols. I always read um, uh, Lawyers, Guns, and Money. I always read the Lawfare blog. Actually, you get some really good stuff from from uh, people on the right re writing on Lawfare blog. Um, who else is good that I will never overlook? Um, that's that's enough, I think, isn't it? Uh, I always look at Talking Points memo simply to see what Josh Marshall is watching. Um, he's got some, he's got Tierney Sneed. She's a great new writer and, um, uh, not the weekly. Nope, nope, nope. It's not, it's not the bulwark or definitely not weekly standard, which has been crappy, crappy late. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that, which per, never mind. Um, not the bulwark. Um, I just can't, can you, if that's, uh, Cassie, can you, uh, can you look at, uh, William Crystal and see, um, and, and, um, the book, the thing is actually published on Substack, so you can go to Substack and and see um, see if you can figure out which one he's writing for. Anyway, you guys can Google it too. Uh, I'm sorry, I just can't think of the name of it. I'm getting old here. Um, so um, it looks like that is the end of our uh, 50 minutes. Is that I don't know if that's correct. Tim, do you want to come back on and 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 hit anything else that you might like to hit? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. Um, First of all, I wanted to thank you, Heather, for uh, engaging and indulging us in a provocative conversation that, at least on my part, has produced plenty of endorphins, I think, of a construction, constructive sort. I can't offhand think of the magazine either. I've been Googling wildly. but Let me, you talk, and I will do it right now, because it's actually really quite good. Um, and I also wanted to thank everybody for, for joining in. Um, I, as Heather says, this is a moment for her book. Um, it fits uh, in so many ways in its provocativeness, but also the kind of historical thoughtfulness that it's not just provocative, it's based uh, in history and historical context. Uh, it makes it very special. So I'm simply filling time while Heather looks up um, the magazine, which is not the bulwark and not the weekly standard, but. Okay, so hold on. Um... Go ahead, Tim. Tell us what you got on the on the uh, on the docket these days. Ah, well, um, that's such a good question. Uh, happy to. Let's see. Uh, the book that I'm excited about at the moment uh, is Lou Mazur's Concise History of United States History. Um, it's 260 pages um, of of Lou Mazur's aggregated wisdom over 50 years of teaching and thinking about it. And it's just such a good book. It's like a short Jill Lepore. Um, Sure. Really, it's about, yeah, it's about a third the size of it, but um, so I'm hoping that that book will do well. It's called The Sum of Our Dreams, uh, A Concise History of America. So that's what I'm excited about. But I'm also excited that your book is still selling. So let's not, uh, you know, that, that goes without saying. Uh, did you find it? I did. It's The Dispatch. The Dispatch. Um, again, you don't have to agree with everything that's written in The Dispatch, but there's some, there, you know, what, what I found really exciting about it was that it's got really, it's got new ideas and it's got new internally logical ideas and it's, you know, it's pushing new intellectual envelopes and that's really overdue, I think, for uh, the conservative movement because it has become such a, such an echo chamber and a lot of these people have stepped out of that echo chamber and are making, you know, arguments that are worth grappling with and so I was a huge fan when I found that um, and uh, it would be good if I could actually remember the name more often, wouldn't it, and send more people to it. Well, there you are, and now we know, and now we've been provoked. Um, so, 
Um, I can sort of see your next book, which I think is the language of politics, how language defines narrative and how narrative defines us, which in many ways, of course, is what you've already written, but slightly different. Um, I was just thinking about your taking on Hayden White and really sort of philosophical basis of narrative and language itself and the political unconscious. Um, anyway, enough of this. Heather. We definitely could do that, but I think my next book is Sleep. How do I love you? <laughs> Absolutely deserved. Again, thank you, Heather, so much. Thank you for everybody for joining in and signing off.